Okay, so this is math three, sorry, math 466, lecture 32, last one. Um, so what I want to do is I want to do the isoparametric inequality. How many of you remember Green's theorem for multivariable? Okay, that's the expression I was expecting to get. So what I'll do is I will first state Green's theorem, we'll use it to prove the isoparametric inequality, and then we will spend the rest of the class just reviewing why Green's theorem is true. This is one of the gems of multivariable calculus vector analysis. It's one of the generalizations of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So Green's theorem is the following. So let's imagine we have you know, nice functions, you know, p and q from r2 to r. Then if I have some nice curve gamma here and some nice region omega inside, and you know, again, you can discuss what do you mean. Maybe I'll take a nice, smooth, simply connected curve. Maybe it'll be piecewise smooth. Then I'll have the line integral along gamma of p dx plus q dy will be the double integral over omega of dq dx minus dp dy dx dy. Okay. Does at least the statement look familiar? Sadly. Sadly. Okay. So it's something that should be done in math one, in multivariable calculus. But we split here and we do 150 and 151. This is usually not covered in math 150. Unless I'm teaching it, I believe I will not make it to heaven if my Calc 3 students do not see Green's theorem. So I make sure we cover this. Why is this useful? Well, it's useful if one of the integrals can be done easily and the other can't. So the idea is you want a problem where at least one of the integrals is easy. The nicest expression for this quantity would be zero. You know, if that expression is zero, it's really easy to do. There's another choice which is pretty easy. Imagine dq dx is equal to one, and imagine dp dy is equal to negative one. So maybe we have, you know, q of x y equals x, and p of x y equals negative y. In this special case, well, we're going to just get the integrand as 2, so we'll just get twice the area of omega is the line integral along gamma of p dx, so that'll be negative y dx, right, plus x dy. So if we can evaluate this line integral, we can calculate the area. So it all comes down to when are we able to calculate these line integrals. So the isoparametric problem, and Professor Morgan is a huge uh, research in this area, isoparametric problem. If I give you a fixed perimeter, what's the maximum area it can enclose? So, enclose maximum area for a perimeter and which we assume the perimeter equals. Sure, I want to find the maximum area for a given perimeter. So without loss of generality, what should the given perimeter be? No, not x. Well, we want to prove it's a circle. What should, the le what should the length of that perimeter be without loss of generality? So one possibility is to do 2 pi r. You would not do 2 pi r, though. You would do 2 pi. So one possibility is to do the perimeter as 2 pi. The other possibility is to do the perimeter as 1. Those are the two natural numbers. You know, Because the perimeter is fixed, I can change my units of measurement. There are infinitely many natural numbers, but they're not infinitely many good choices. Choices, right? Without loss of generality. No, because you have negatives. So, oh, wait, you said natural, not yeah, integer. Natural. Oh, yeah, oh, no, then you're fine. Then you're fine. Then you're fine. 
Um, so without large disparity, you want to adjust it either one or two pi. And this comes back to Fourier analysis. How do we want to do our units? Do we want to have the interval 0, 1, or do we want to work with the interval 0, 2 pi? So we'll choose to do it a perimeter of 1. Okay. So I will assume that our curve assume gamma is from 0, 1 to R2. That's our curve. And we'll assume it's smooth. Smooth is a little bit much. We don't need it to be you know, smooth. Just even once or twice differentiable is more than enough. I want to be able to write gamma as Fourier series. So I want you know, gamma of t will be x of t, y of t, where x of t is going to be the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of a n e to the 2 pi i n t. And similarly, y of t will be the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of b n e to the 2 pi i n t. And so when I look at these coefficients, without loss of generality, I can actually choose the value of one coefficient for x and one coefficient for y. Which coefficients can I choose? It won't affect anything. So when you look at, I can I, well, I can choose one of these coefficients to have a specific value, to simplify the sum ever so slightly. The zeroth coefficient. What can I choose the zeroth coefficient to be? Zero. It just shifts the whole curve, right? So without loss of generality, I can assume A0 is 0, and I can assume B0 is 0. So without loss of generality, A0 equals B0 equals 0. OK? So the only coefficients I have to worry about are the ends where n is not equal to 0. Now, it's time to go back to some calculus concepts that you probably have not seen in a while. Parametrizing a curve by unit speed. Did you do that or not? So. I think we did. I think those are the concepts I was really bad at. Right. You know, this is supposed to. Yeah, that's terrifying. Exactly. Yo. The, the first digit of this course number is 4, which means I am obligated to the department to connect this to things you have either seen or should have seen. And this is basically the last chance before you all leave. So what it means to be parametrized by arc length. So let's look at x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. I want that to equal 1. This would be the square of my speed. Well, if the square of my speed is 1, what's my speed? 1. So basically, this is just saying I'm always traveling my curve at a constant speed of 1. If you wanted to travel at different speeds, I could just replace t with some nice, you know, strictly increasing function g of t. And then that would allow me to accelerate and slow down. If you look at the track of a roller coaster, are you going through a roller coaster at constant speed? No. Right? At least not on the roller coasters that I'm forced to go on. The ones I'd like to go on, you probably would go on on constant speed. <laughs> okay? So That's it. Well, you, you never actually jump it, right? Because you have to accelerate it. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> they, could, they could drop me down. Look, you're on a roller coaster. I want a roller coaster right now. That's right. <laughs> this is about the level I like. Um, so. I want my curve to be going unit speed. Now, my curve, you know, for every number between 0 and 1, I give you a point on the curve. This is why I'm choosing the perimeter to be of length 1. Because if I'm going unit speed and I go for one unit of time, my length should be 1. So one of the biggest problems here is where do the two pi's come from? All right, well, let's calculate. All of them? Excellent. I actually now have a pi mug. All right. So, f from the all right. So let's look at this before things collapse too much. All right. 
how would we calculate x prime of t squared? So you could take the derivative term rise. So you know, x prime of t will be you know the sum of two pi i n a n e to the two pi i n t, and we would have something similar for y prime. And now, if I integrate from zero to one of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt, I'll have an integral from 0 to 1. I'll have sums. n goes from minus infinity to infinity. And then I'll have x prime squared. So I'll have uh, 2 pi i n a n e. I'll just do n t. Then I'll have a sum over m minus infinity to infinity, 2 pi i m a m e m t plus the y crap dt. Right. So there was a comment that this does not look pleasant. But if I'm calculating something like x prime of t, there's a small mistake here. I should be taking the complex conjugate here. What I really want is I want my length squared. Now, because I have complex conjugate, the only term that survives is when n minus m equals 0. So the only term that survives is the n equals m. So I'm going to get the integral from 0 to 1, um, the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of 4 pi squared um, I and I complicate becomes 1. I'll have n squared a n squared plus b n squared coming from the y term dt. But what's the integral going to be? Yeah, I'm integrating t goes from 0 to 1 of the sum of 4 pi squared n squared a n squared plus b n squared dt. There's no t dependence. So what's the integral? Integral is just 1. So this will just be the sum n goes from minus infinity to infinity of 4 pi squared n squared and then a n squared plus b n squared. And what should this integral equal? So what should this integral, what are we integrating? What's the integrand? One. The integral is 1. So this should just be? One. This should just be 1. OK? So we know this expression is 1 because I'm just integrating 1. And then I'm expanding out what is x prime, what is y prime. And this is why Fourier series are so nice. These things are going. Which sum? This sum? y prime of t and absolute value, because I'm just parametrizing by unit speed. Okay. So this is going back to I have a curve, and I want to be traveling along the curve at every moment in time such that my speed is constant. Okay. And if it's going to be constant, you might as well make it 1. So they often talk about being parametrized by arc length. I think that was the term they used. Oh, yeah. And typically, you'll do ds, which will be the square root of this. One of the nice things about having the speed be 1 is you don't have to really matter, is it the square root or is it the square? They're the same. All right, so now we know we have our definition for what gamma is. Let's now calculate the integral of negative y dx plus x dy. It's going to be very similar to the calculation we've just done. So we get 2 times the area 
of omega is the integral from 0 to 1 of, now we have negative y dx. So this will be minus y of t x prime of t dt plus x of t y prime of t dt. Well, now when I do this integration, I'm going to have a sum for y and a sum for x. And the only thing that's going to matter is when I have my opposites. And so when the dust settles, um, I will have um, the sum. It goes from minus infinity to infinity. So here, if I had the term a n, oh no, I'm sorry, y's was b's. Yes. So let's see, so I get bn, and I think a negative n. And well, but, sorry, let's just do it slowly. So I'll have equals integral from 0 to 1. So I'll have negative ah, bn en of t, and then x prime will give me a sum m goes from negative infinity to infinity of 2 pi i m a n e m t dt. And then plus I'll have the other term. And so I think I need to take a complex conjugate here. Right, the way we always do these dot products, you always have to take a complex conjugate so you have something that's real valued. So then this would be complex conjugate here. OK. And so what we'll get now when we integrate is n has to be the same as m. We'll get a sum. n goes from minus infinity to infinity. We will get the negative and negative reinforce with a complex conjugate will get 2 pi i n. And then we'll have b n a n bar. And then over here, it'll be the other way. No, because we have the complex conjugate of i. So that gives us a minus. The minus reinforces the minus there. And then the next term will be minus. Now it'll be a n bn bar. OK, this is where more board space would be nice. So we have the following expression for twice the area. Now, when you look at this, how do we look at something like this? We have bn a n bar minus a n b n bar. Mm -hmm. So we have bn a n bar minus a n uh, b n bar. So this is equal to what? So this is the complex conjugate of this, right? So we're taking the difference of two complex conjugates. You know, we have basically z minus the complex conjugate of z. That should be twice the real part. Um, maybe it's twice the imaginary. Oh, so we're, we're, sub we're subtracting. Right, so the real, real parts cancel. The imaginary parts are reinforced, right? So this will be twice the imaginary part of Vn An. So 
So now if we put absolute values, this would be less than or equal to twice Bn An. Okay, so this is just a general inequality. If I have uh, x plus iy and I subtract x minus iy, the complex conjugate, the real parts cancel and I get 2iy. So I guess initially we would have an i there, but when we take the absolute value, it's going to go on. It's going to be gone. So now, in absolute value, this is at most 2b and a n. This is less than or equal to a n squared plus b n squared. And the reason is, if I look at this over here, if I subtract this, you know, a n squared plus b n squared minus 2 a n b n is just absolute value of a n minus absolute value of b n squared. And that will be greater than or equal to 0. So you know, twice, you know, b and a n in absolute value is at most a n squared plus b n squared. So this is going to allow us to understand this inequality over here. All right, is everybody comfortable with this expression to replace the absolute value of a n, of b n a n bar minus a n b n bar? Okay, so I'm going to erase the scrap work, and then we will go back and we'll have... 2 area of omega is going to be less than or equal to the sum, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, of 2 pi n a n squared plus b n squared. I just took absolute values. Um, so what did I do? Yeah, so I probably should put like an absolute values around these. Each term will be multiplied by an i, so it's not going to make a difference. Okay, so we have the following. This is really close to what we had before. We had 4 pi squared n squared a n squared plus b n squared. So the only difference is we had an n squared rather than an n. So I claim that this is less than or equal to uh, the sum, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, of... 2 pi n squared a n squared plus b n squared. What's the only way that this can be an equality? So the question is, when am I losing information? So whenever you do you know, estimates, you always want to ask, where is information lost? So if n is not plus or minus 1, we don't have to worry about n equals 0. If n is not plus or minus 1, we're magnifying something. Unless a n equals b n equals 0. So if a n equals b n equals 0, then it doesn't matter what I do. If a n and b n, if at least one of them is not 0, then I've now made this smaller. So. So I'm sorry. At this point, it's still an inequality. So it's a strict inequality if an a n or b n does not equal 0 for n not equal to plus or minus 1. It's an equality if only a plus or minus 1, b plus or minus 1 do not equal 0. So if there's any term, any value of n where one of these is not 0, then this is a strict inequality. 
So now we know uh, twice the area is less than or equal to, all right, what we had there is we had a 4 pi squared n squared. We have a 2 pi. So let's multiply by both sides by 2 pi. So we get 4 pi area is less than or equal to the sum, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, of 4 pi n squared a n squared plus b n squared. But what do we know about this expression? It's 1. Therefore, area is less than or equal to 1 over 4 pi. And the perimeter is 1. All right, let's find out if we've dropped any pi's or 2's. If the perimeter is 1, you are thinking circle, and what would be the radius? Circle with radius 1 over 2 pi, and that has area pi 1 over 2 pi squared is 1 over 4 pi. So good. Up until now, we've not dropped any factors. Does this prove that if you have a curve of minimal length, I'm sorry, if you have a, a curve of length 1 enclosing minimal area, it must be a circle. Curve, a curve, of, sorry, curve of length 1, so I can't, curve of length 1 enclosing the maximum possible area, it must be a circle. Have we proved that? What? I'm sorry? We haven't, what have we proved? The maximum area is the same as the area you would get for a circle. We haven't shown that, we haven't shown, we've shown that this is a solution. We haven't shown that it is the only solution. Now, we are in pretty good shape. There's not that many candidates left because we know that the only possibilities have, you know, a plus and minus 1, b plus and minus 1 not equal to 0. So we don't have that many curves to look at. And so because I want to talk a little bit about Green's theorem, I will leave that last lit little bit to look at in the notes where they basically say, you know, if you assume that the curve has its maximum x displacement at time 0, that's going to force it to be cosine. And it will force like a plus 1 and a minus 1 to align. And then once you have that, it's cosine, then that will force the y similarly. So it's not that much more work from this point onward to get that it is, only, it is the only solution. All right, so this is just an, another application of Fourier analysis. You know, what can we do with all the stuff we've done? We needed Green's theorem as an ingredient. We did put on some assumptions that the curve was smooth. And then the question is, what happens if the curve is not smooth? Well, can we approximate a non-smooth curve by a smooth curve? How close can we do? And then how pathological of a curve can we get? So, you know, we did do the Weierstrass nowhere differentiable function. We, um, this function is not differentiable, but the Fourier coefficients are decaying so fast that if we truncate it at any finite point, we have a really good approximation to it, which is infinitely differentiable. So looking at smooth curves, proving things for smooth curves, and then talking about things that are close to that, it's not a bad way to go. Now, there are other things you could try to do for this problem. You could try to do simpler versions. So this was looking at an arbitrary curve. Instead of looking at an arbitrary curve, what kind of restrictions might you try to do for your curve gamma? You know, it's too hard to look at every possible curve. So I'm going to restrict myself to a certain type of curve. What type of curve might you try? You're still studying the maximum area. Yeah, you still want the maximum area for a given perimeter. What kind of restrictions might you choose on your curve gamma? What kind of shapes? Closed curve. Okay, cl closed curve. Be more specific. What kind of closed curve? So if you have something like this, if you have two loops, it seems like you should do better. So you'll... Then the question is, can you prove that if the curve intersects itself that you could always do better by somehow, well, I've got this over here at 1 and just extend it outward. 
you might be able to then try to prove that the curve must be convex. If it's dipping inward at some point, well, take these two points, you know, and here's the rest of the curve, flip it outward, and you'll get more area. So you could try to prove that the curve has to be convex. You could try to prove that the curve doesn't intersect itself. You know, rather than trying to do the general case, see if you can make some advancement by making restrictions. What else could you do? There's a certain class of curves, and you want to get maybe the class gets more and more complex as you go. What would be a really good type of curve to look at? Simple, the simplest curve you could think of. So but then that would go like this. Well, I, I want a closed curve. So you could do a circle. What's an approximation to a circle? A square. And in fact, simpler than a square. Simpler than a square. Triangle. Right? I was going to say, you know, instruments for people who are not musically gifted. Restrict yourself to the set of all triangles. Which triangle has the maximum area for a given perimeter? Equilateral. So one thing you could do is A, B, C, the semi-perimeter A plus B plus C over 2. So if there was homework for this class, a good homework problem would be Helen's formula. Show that the area is the semi-perimeter, uh, semi-perimeter minus A, semi-perimeter minus B, semi-perimeter minus C. I'm trying to think if I have to divide by 2. Maybe divide by something independent of A, B, and C, and then take a square root of that. I can't remember if you have to divide by 2 or not in Heron's formula. So prove Heron's formula, and then prove that the best you do is when you have an equilateral triangle. So one possibility you could do is imagine A and B are not the same size. What you could then do is you could say, well, let me replace A and B with their average. And so if you want, view here's side C, here's A and B, and then here's side C, and then here's the equilateral triangle with A plus B over 2, A plus B over 2. And then this is very similar to the old Farmer-Brown problem from calculus with perimeter, that if A and B are not equal, this will actually give you a little bit more. And this will prove that if a maximum exists, then the maximum has to be where all the sides are equal. Because if not, you could just keep iterating this. And then you need to use some results from real analysis that says if you have a continuous function on a compact set, closed bounded set, it will attain its maximum and minimum. The maximum exists. If the maximum did not have A equals B equals C, you would have a contradiction. So that would handle the triangle. This is beginning to seem like the random matrix theory stuff where the small cases weren't so bad and got worse and worse as we went higher. How would you handle a quadrilateral? Can you break a quadrilateral up maybe into different triangles? And if two sides weren't the same, could you somehow get an improvement? So could you assume maybe it's a regular n you know, Can you prove that the regular n is the best if you have to have n sides? And then we have a formula for what the regular n area is. And we can see that this will converge to a circle. So that would be a good series of problems to try to do. Okay? We can avoid having to go through all these cases. But you know, if you want, you could think of it as, well, if I have a nice finite curve, I can break it up into n pieces. And now it's like, a re now it's like an n gone. And maybe I can make all those pieces the same size, maybe not, and just try to play games like this. So for the last bit of class, I just want to do a quick sketch of Green's theorem. Right. How many people remember the proof of Green's theorem? Okay. They don't teach it in 150. I teach it in 150 because I feel that if students don't see Green's theorem, it's not multi calculus. You know, this is one of the uh, key points of the course. OK, yeah, so it's worth knowing. So we have the integral of omega of dq dx minus dp dy dx dy is the integral 
of p dx plus q dy integral over gamma. And here is my curve gamma. Here's my region omega. Okay. So frequently we do this for squares first or rectangles. And then once we know it for rectangles, we prove it in general. So rectangles first. So we'll call this gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, and in a shocker, gamma 4. This will be the point AC. This will be the point BC. This will be the point BD. And this will be the point AD. So I have a double integral here. I'm going to do the double integral and show that it equals the line integral. You're integrating dq dx, and you're integrating dp dy. Do you want to integrate dq dx with respect to x first or with respect to y first? So you're integrating dq dx. They're just our functions. So you know, p and q are functions from r2 to r. So would you rather integrate this first with respect to x or first with respect to y? X. Would you rather integrate this with respect to x first or with respect to y? Why? I'm asking, give me an antiderivative of a function whose derivative is dq dx. I'll go with q. And since we're going to be evaluating at two different points, it doesn't matter which antiderivative I choose. So if I look at the integral of dq dx dx dy, well, I do the x integral first. So x goes from a to b. y goes from c to d. So I fix a value of y. And so now I'll have the integral y goes from c to d. And now I get the integral of dq dx with respect to x. That's just q. And I evaluate it at, y, at x equals b. And I subtract it off at x equals a. So I'll get q at the point by minus q at the point x, y. I'm sorry, uh, q at the point a, y. And the dy. Well, let's look at the integral of q, dy. The integral of q, dy along gamma 1. Do I have my signs correct? Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I integrate q dy along gamma 1, what is dy along gamma 1? Zero. zero. So the integral of q dy along gamma 1 is 0. Along gamma 2, that'll just be q of by dy. You know, I fix x to be b, and then y is just going from c all the way to d. So this part is actually just the integral along gamma 2 of q dy. On this part, dy is 0. And on this part, this would just be the integral of you know, q dy. But now we're going down rather than going up. Ah, that's what the minus sign is. So the minus sign gives us the correct orientation. And so the other one is going to be plus the integral over gamma 4 with its orientation of q, d, of q dy. So this proves that this term over here goes to that term over there. A similar argument will give you the minus dp dy gives you the p dx. And this proves Green's theorem for a rectangle. Okay. Any questions about the proof in the rectangle? OK, so now let's consider a more general curve. So the idea is you put the curve in a giant box, and you slice it up into lots of rectangles.
Now, all the interior rectangles are really nice. Because for this interior rectangle, I go through the four sides like this, and I go through the four sides of this one like this, and what do you notice? They cancel out. So all the interior sides cancel. And so the problem is I'm curved at the very boundary. I would much rather have uh, a polygonal approximation. And so this is where that small little bit of analysis comes in. Uh, did anybody prove this in a class at Williams? OK, that's good. Uh, from real analysis or from uh, multi? From, oh, from real, OK. So did anybody see a proof of this? So what we can do is if we make the mesh fine enough, you know, I'll have something that looks like this. And we want to show that if I take this integral and instead I integrate along a polygonal approximation, that the difference is small. And then we can replace the polygonal line integral with integrating along the curve. OK? And then you'll still have the area, and you'll have the area is equal to the polygonal area on the boundary. So all you have to do is show that you can replace those small little curves with little polygonal pieces. You need to be a little bit careful. Uh, we have how much time left? So I'll prove that all curves have the same length. All curves have the same length. All curves have the same length if from one point, if from, I guess, if from same start and end and say monotonic. I'll give myself a few restrictions to help. All right. We all agree that's the fastest way to get from point A to point B. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a polygonal curve, which is a really good approximation to it. OK. Do we all agree that that's a really good approximation? So if I approximate the length of this curve with the length of the polygonal curve, that should be the same, right? So length of straight line is approximately the same as the length of the polygonal approximation. And then if we send epsilon to 0, they should converge, right? Do we agree with that statement? Because this is an extremely good approximation. Yes or no? Are people comfortable with that, that the length of the polygonal curve is approximately the same as the length of the original curve. All right, let's collapse all the horizontal segments down, and let's sweep all the vertical segments to the right. The sum of the polygonal is now the two bases, and that's the hypotenuse. So move horizontal down, move vertical left, and now we have the hypotenuse equals a plus b, which violates Pythagoras. ds is the square root 
of dx squared plus dy squared. This goes back to a groan from earlier in the class about how they hate ds. What I was doing is I was saying ds is equal to dx plus dy. Because I was saying the length of the polygonal is approximately equal to the length of the original curve. That's not the case. So you have to be, unfortunately, extremely careful when you're doing these analyses. If you want to calculate you know, perimeters for something like this, perimeters are hard. Areas are much easier, because small mistakes like this are negligible. But here, the fact that we have a square root means that ds is not dx plus dy. And so, for instance, if this is a 45 degree angle, then you're off by a factor of square root of 2. You're off by about 40%. That's a significant amount to be off by. So the question is, what are we actually calculating? We've got to be extremely careful. So there is work that is needed to make this rigorous when you are replacing curves with straight lines. If we're going for areas, there's no problem <coughs> in replacing things with areas. And then what you, we're trying to do is we're trying to do uh, certain you know, vector-valued integrals. And these line integrals are different than just integrating the function 1. So if I integrate my function you know, along this line integral with the dx and dy, that will be different than just taking the lengths and adding the lengths. So that's the part you've got to be careful about. All right, this is a good place to stop. Uh, there is no class. Doesn't want to. Doesn't want to. Let me turn it off. Actually, so.